come on Come on, let's praise him right now like your breakthrough's here. Come on, let's praise him right now. Let's worship him like your breakthrough's here. Come on, let's praise him right now in spirit and in truth. Your breakthrough is here right now. Right now. Right now. One more time, somebody shout right now like your breakthrough's here. Shout with a voice of triumph this morning. Shout with a voice of triumph this morning. Before you're seated, lift your hands with me right now. Lord, we're asking you to be here. Lord, we're asking you to be in the house. We're not going to censor you. We're not going to quench you. We're not going to grieve you. We're not going to impede you or obstruct you. Actually, God, in every way, we want you to loose your Holy Ghost in this place right now. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we are begging you to be here, Lord. God, we are begging you to move in our families right now, Lord. We're begging you to set people free right now, Lord, in this place. Every promise is true, God, and we want you to loose it in your house this morning. Somebody say, in Jesus' name. <coughs> High five your neighbor this morning as you're seated. Is Jesus Lord of your life today? Is he still King of Kings? So good to see everybody here in December. This week, I think Jesus beat Santa Claus. I'm going to test you all on end of December here, see if Jesus still beats Santa Claus. Every day. I want to speak to you for the next few moments about waiting in the waiting and as I thought about Christmas time I don't want to be like the Israelites because the Christmas present came wrapped in a different package than they expected they didn't like the time that it came and they didn't like where it came and they didn't like how it came and so they missed their gift I don't care how God sends the gift I don't care how God wraps the gift I don't care how it comes or when it comes I don't care if I don't like the gift. I want God's will in my life. So I'm going to prepare myself in the waiting because I don't want to miss the greatest miracle of my life because it came in a green package and I wanted it in a red package. I don't care if I have to go through some things to get the gift that I didn't like that I had to go through because God has to prepare me for the gift. If you don't want to miss the gift and you don't care how it's coming and you don't care when it's coming and you don't care how it looks, if you just know you don't want to miss the gift, one more time, throw your hands in the air and say, God, however it's coming, however it's coming, I'm ready. However it's coming, whatever it looks like, I want to be ready. I want to be ready. Dr. Seuss says this that we're waiting for a train or, or to go or for a bus to come or we're waiting for a plane or the mail to come. We're waiting for the rain to go or the phone to ring or the snow to snow or waiting around for a yes or a no or some of us are waiting for our hair to grow. Everyone is waiting, waiting for the fish to bite, waiting for the wind to fly a kite, 
or waiting around for Friday night or waiting perhaps for their Uncle Jake or a pot to boil or just waiting for a better break or a string of pearls or a pair of pants or a wig with curls or God, just another chance. Everybody's waiting. Don't mind waiting for you, Lord. See, a few years ago, I was try trying to travel home. I was doing a conference in Indianapolis, and I was early for my flight. You know, you got to get there early to go through TSA, then you got to get there early to sit for your flight, then you got to get there, right? So you hurry to wait. And I had a long, coming from Indy to San Diego with a layover, it's a long day. It's a, it's a six hour flight time by the time you'd land and all this stuff, six hours. And I was there early and the flight was canceled. And it was the last flight that they could get me to San Diego from there. So I, I said, well, there, there's gotta be another way. Sunday's tomorrow. I'm a minister at a church. I said, I gotta be home. And so I'm waiting with a bunch of other disgruntled, waiting passengers. But when I finally got home, it was so worth it to see my little kids, to see my children, to see my wife. See, it was worth the wait because the gift at the end, what I was going to receive, those hugs, those kisses, those daddies, I missed you. It didn't matter. I, for, I actually, I forgot about what, sitting in the Indianapolis airport for four hours. I forgot about the missed flight and having to catch another flight in Minneapolis and trying to, and trying to get home. I forgot about all the stress and the worries. And I forgot about, I, you know what? I forgot about having to preach the next day at Sunday at Truvine. I forgot about all that. Because the gift was worth the wait. Life is full of waiting, sad times, good times, bad times. In fact, waiting is probably one of the most irritating experiences we have. You go into a waiting room at the doctor's office, magazines from 1992, announcing President Bill Clinton and Minnesota Twins winning the World Series. The last time the Minnesota Twins ever won anything. You're listening to TV shows in a language you don't even understand. Sitting there waiting. There was a story about a man who went into the doctor and waited for an hour in the lobby. Then he went into the exam room. They shut the door. He waited another 45 minutes. The doctor came in and sat down looking at his chart. He said, how old are you? The old man sarcastically said, do you want to know how old I was when I got here or how old I am now? Doctors' waiting rooms are awful. You have no idea how long it's going to take before you're called. They, tell, they call you the day before, you tell you to come in early, and then they're late. You have no control over anything. The glass window that separates you and the receptionist looks bulletproof. Somebody comes in after you but gets called before you. The music is driving you nuts. And how about everybody coughing, sneezing, breathing on you, and you don't know what they got? God sends us to waiting places. His waiting room is part of our plans. We don't know how it's going to happen. We don't know when it's going to happen, but we know it's going to happen. It's part of God's waiting plans. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts 1, familiar passage of Scripture. We're going to go through 2 through 9. And we're going to break down this story a little bit. Acts 1, 2 through 9. It says, until the day in which he was taken up. This is Jesus. He was taken up, his ascension. If you're able to, would you stand with me for respect for the word of the Lord? This is Jesus here. Until the day in which Jesus was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Commandments, directions. To whom also he 
showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days, and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. Which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things right there in the moment when they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. God, we receive your word, your anointed word, the word that's forever settled in heaven. God, speak in this house this morning to God that you would meet needs, that you would direct lives, that you would guide hearts, that you would touch marriages, that you would touch families. God, that you would heal families, that you would heal sickness and disease that come under the power and the name of Jesus, God. God, loose it in this building today. Someone say in Jesus' name. You may be seated. So Jesus met with his disciples after the resurrection. He met with them in a prayer meeting. Then he met with them out in the open. When Jesus met with his disciples, they were fishing when he got them. But then something happened. It's what took place. All of a sudden, boom, he, he ascends into heaven. He looks at them, and he gives them very specific instructions. Because instructions mean everything. If you follow the instructions, the outcome will be favorable. It will be deliverable. You can count on the end product if you follow the instructions. But you have to follow the instructions precisely as written. You can't deviate from the instructions. Have you ever bought anything from Ikea? We bought something from Ikea one time. I'm not a handyman. Ask Brother Mike. I am not a handyman at all. That's not my gifting. Ashley says I need help when I have to put a light bulb in. So we, we bought something from Ikea, bought a desk. I'm trying to put it together. I'm reading the instructions. And I, you would think that whoever wrote these instructions, they, they're in English, but they're not in English. There's not a lot of words, just pictures. So if you're really good at putting stuff together from pictures, you'd be great. I got to the end of that project, and I had a lot of extra pieces. <laughs> a lot of extra pieces. You know, Ash was gone at the store. I just kind of put them all in the garage, put that desk up there. It broke a few months later. You know, and then the next time I said, you know, just go to one of those stores where it's already put together. <laughs> Let's just pay the extra money when it's already done. Have a, actually and, and see if they can deliver too. Christmas is it's great until the time I have to put all the toys together. Like, how does this, is he in here? No. How does this Paw Patrol lookout tower, if you don't know what that is, Google it. It's in my house. He doesn't know it yet, so please don't tell him. And I'm thinking, I don't even want to open that box because the box is like this tall. And I'm thinking, all the pieces in there that I'm going to have to put together. And you know how it is with kids' toys. You get to the end, and you can't go back to the beginning because you, like, you're trying to... So you just hope it works for three or four months, kid. But instructions are important. I'm not good at following Ikea's instructions. But Acts chapter 1, these instructions are what Jesus speaks to his tribe, his people, right before he ascends. He left instructions to the apostles. They were, they were chosen by what? The Bible says by the Holy Ghost. By the Holy Spirit, they were chosen. When you select people that are around you, you need to select people by the Holy Ghost, not by your preferences. Sometimes you don't need a buddy. God wants to use the Holy Ghost to put somebody there that's going to help guide and lead you. 
if Jesus needed the Holy Ghost to help him direct the apostles, you need the Holy Ghost to help direct you. Let me just be honest here for a minute. So when you select those that are around you, use the Holy Ghost. So it's incredible. After suffering the cross, Jesus appeared to the disciples. After 40 day period, Jesus proved to them with convincing signs that he was resurrected, the Savior. During those encounters, he taught them the truths of the kingdom of God. He shared meals with them. He ate with them. He talked with them, right? Do you know that most big-time CEOs, when they get hired somewhere, they don't just have a formal meeting. They have dinners, and they go out, and they talk. And, they, and they're, what are they doing? They want to see who that person really is outside of the boardroom. Because in an interview, for 30 minutes, you can fake anybody out. But when you have dinner two or three times together, you, the real you start, like you start, they're like, oh, he takes the last chicken wing every, he eats the last appetizer every time. You know what, if he eats the last appetizer every time, doesn't even ask anybody else if they want him, when push comes to shove, he's going to take care of himself before he takes care of the company. So you need to test those people that are around you in the Holy Ghost. You need to test them. But what if you're starving? You're still supposed to ask for the last, it's just common courtesy. Does anybody want the last nacho? Jesus instructed him, here's his instructions. Here's the important part. Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait here until after you receive the gift. So wait here. Why is it important that they wait in Jerusalem? I want you to hear me. Do not leave Jerusalem. Each and every one of us has a Jerusalem. It would have been logical for them to leave Jerusalem. But why would Jesus instruct them not to leave Jerusalem? Because they were inclined to leave Jerusalem. See, here's the deal. Why would they leave Jerusalem? They just killed their best friend in Jerusalem. They just killed their leader in Jerusalem. Who was next on the most wanted list in Jerusalem? So their natural tendency would be to what? Leave Jerusalem. So Jesus, very important, he says, look, there is something very specific and very powerful about Jerusalem, and I want you to stay here. So many times in life when things get tough and things get rough and things get, we lose our job or we go through a situation, we want to leave our very destiny that God has called us to be at. Just because the economy gets bad doesn't mean that you pack your bags and move to a different nation. No, maybe God has called you here. Have you used the Holy Ghost to discern where God has called you to be? There's a reason why you're in Temecula. There's a reason why you're in Marietta. There's a reason why you're in Menifee. Because God has placed you here by his direction. So why would they leave? Because they didn't want to be killed next. So for them to leave would have been a good thing in their mind. It would be logical in their mind. See, because they were saying this. They couldn't allow everybody in Jerusalem to think that Jesus actually resurrected or his prophecies would have been true. So they started rumors that the disciples stole the body. And that the disciples, so, they, so the disciples were worried. Everybody thinks we stole the bodies. Everybody's trying to kill us. Hello, I'm going to go somewhere else. Here's what I want you to know. That, that what happened in Jerusalem could not have happened in Bethany, could not have happened in Nazareth. It only happened in Jerusalem. There are some things God calls you to and tells you that will only happen where he tells you to be and where he tells you to go. It might not be logical for your mother. It might not be logical for your father. But it is logical for you because God spoke it to you. Where you are and who you are determines how you are. So I want to be where I need to be, how I need to be, so God can give me the gift that I'm supposed to get. So I have to stay in my Jerusalem. I have to stay in my destiny. Have you ever dro drove into a city or you flew into another country and you flew into an area and you just felt something different? It wasn't home. I'm not trying to be super mystical or super crazy, or, but I'm telling you, a couple years ago, Ashley and I flew in to do a camp in a, another city on the East Coast, and I won't get into all the details, but you could feel, when we drove into that city, you could feel an oppression. 
There were things that couldn't happen in that city because of the oppression that was in that city. There are things that we're blessed with here in Temecula and in America and in San Diego that we have people have gone before us and prayed through some things so the gift can come. So if you remove yourself from the area where the gift is going to fall, you're not going to receive the gift. Here's what's important about Jerusalem. Jerusalem was not just any city. It was the prophetic city of destiny. It was the city David conquered. Let me get, I'll, get you, I'll get back to this. Let me put this in perspective. 2 Samuel 5, 6. It wasn't just any place, okay? That's why they had to wait in Jerusalem. And the king, go back to 2 Samuel 5, 6. Look this up when you get home. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites. And the inhabitants of the land who spoke to David said this. You shall not come in here, but the blind and the lame will repel you. They said, David cannot come in here. So David went to Jerusalem to fight against the De Jebusites, the original inhabitants of the land. The Jebusites taunted David, he, like mocked him, said, our blind and our lame, you can't even beat them. Jer Jerusalem wasn't just any city. It was the prophetic city that David conquered. Son of David, have mercy on me. Remember they said that in the New Testament? Son of David, have mercy on me. That David conquered the city that was the centerpiece to Jesus' ministry. To this day, that city is still blessed and called by God. To, that, to this day, that city still has prophetic destiny. That's why in the new Jerusalem, there's going to be a new Jerusalem, a new heaven. They didn't say there's going to be a new San Diego, a new New York, a new L.A. No, there's only going to be one city that at the end. That's going to be a new what? Jerusalem. It doesn't matter that you want to say, it doesn't matter if I'm not there. It does matter if God tells you specific instructions. It does matter that you follow those instructions to the T. Because when God creates a city and calls it his city, it's not for a day or a year or a century or a hundred thousand years. It's for eternity. So let me tell you something. When God tells you to go somewhere and he says he has a promise for you there, you better get there and you better wait on him. Because if he said the promise is coming, it's coming. It may not come the way you like it. It may not come wrapped the what color you want it in. But the gift is coming to you and your family. So you better wait. You better wait. You better wait. I don't want to be like the Israelites that missed their miracle. I don't want to be like the Israelites that missed their blessing. I don't want to miss the Messiah. I don't care how he comes. I just want to be there when he comes. Listen, listen. I know I'm telling you a lot of history, and this is maybe boring, but hold on. There's an archaeologist over in Jerusalem. All this stuff. He was doing an interview. He was not a Christian. He was Jewish. Historical archaeologist. He was meeting, and I was listening to a podcast, and he was meeting with a couple pastors. He said, do you know something crazy? They said, what? Out of all the 30-plus miracles that Jesus did, only two of those miracles happened inside the Jerusalem walls, the proper of Jerusalem. There's only two miracles that happened. And they said, what two were those miracles? He said, the blind and the lame were healed. In John chapter 5, he healed the lame man in Jerusalem. In John chapter 8, he gave sight to the blind man in the Jerusalem. The Jebusites said, even the blind and lame will keep you out. I want you to know that Jesus took care of everything the enemy said that he couldn't take care of. Let me tell you again, Jesus walked into that city of destiny and he took care of every devil that they said he couldn't take care of. Let me tell you something, you're not getting it yet. Everything the enemy told you you can't do, you can't overcome, you can't win, Jesus Christ already took care of it. I didn't say he will take care of it. He already took care of it. He already took care of your disease. He already took care of your sickness. He already took care of your depression. He already took care of your anxiety. When he died on the cross, when he shed his blood, when he rose out of that grave, he took death, hell, and the keys of the grave. He took it all. Somebody give him some praise this morning. He took everything. 
So what are you worrying about? He took it. What are you anxious about? He took it. What are you concerned about? He took it. What are you sweating about? He took it. What are you worrying about at night? He took it. Somebody put a shout of praise on your lips if he took everything the enemy told you. No worries. No worries. He took everything. He took care of everything that would impede you from living a holy, righteous, Holy Ghost filled, tongue talking, Jesus name, baptized life. He took care of it. He took every care of everything that would hinder your family. He took every care of everything that would hinder your children. He took care of every curse that would come against your grandchildren. He already took care of it. So why would you leave the place God conquers for you to possess? So why would you leave the place that God cleared so you could build? So don't leave Jerusalem, point one. Point one, now don't leave Jerusalem. I got so much here. Why do people leave Jerusalem? Because they have emotional momentum. They're driven by emotions. Up and down, up and down, up and down. They leave because experiential motivation. They need to experience something new. You know how many people I've talked to in relationships? Well, I just, I left, I just needed a new experience. You don't need a new experience. You don't need a new wife. You don't need a new husband. You need a new altar call. Because the gift will transform you. We'll get to that. They leave because of ego, because I can. Okay, okay, what's the next? What, what's coming your way is worth it. How many here struggle to wait? To be honest, you have a hard time waiting in line. You walk into Starbucks, there, and this time of the year, there's 12 people in front of you. You calculate three minutes a drink, 36 minutes, you walk out. But you forgot about the 10 minutes it took you to drive there, the five minutes it took you to walk in, the four minutes it took you to make your, so you just wasted 19 minutes because you calculated the gift was not worth the wait. You've done it at the grocery store. You've seen people leave their carts. How long did they shop to get all that junk? Get to the register and like, oh, no way. I mean, your tongue talk, Holy Ghost, baptized Jesus' name person till you get on the 15 South at 8 o'clock in the morning. And you try to keep the Holy Ghost until you get to about Fallbrook and the devil just ascended in your car. I've seen some of you on the, on the 15 and the 91. I'm like, I don't even know if they went to church last week. Waiting, right? It stinks. How many of you ever went to Disneyland or Universal Studios? You shelled out $125 per beautiful child to get in a line that some of them take 90 minutes to ride a 35 second ride. But what it, the gift, the wait is worth it. How come you'll wait at Disneyland for a silly ride, but you won't wait on the gift from heaven that God has called you to? You'll go give Universal Studios $85 to wait all day for a silly 3D ride, but God has healing and blessing and miracles and deliverance, but you won't wait on that. Oh, where's my waiters? Let's give him some praise. Where's my waiters? See, it's difficult to wait. It's di he could have told him, wait 30 days, wait 39 days, 4 hours and 38 seconds, but he didn't do that. He could have, because they could have left and came back. They could have did it on their terms, but he told him to wait because waiting is hard. Waiting is difficult. Waiting is a challenge. Waiting tests our patience. Waiting puts our faith on trial. When you believe the promise, though, when you know that you know that you know that you know that God is real, you will wait. You will wait. You I ain't going nowhere. I ain't turning back. I'm not going back to the booze. Why? Because I'm waiting on the gift. There are things that are specific to the waiters. There are blessings that are specific to those that wait. Those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. 
They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I don't know if we're getting this here. The Bible says there are certain blessings connected to those that are willing to wait. Hence the term waiter and waitress. Can I help you? Can I take your order? What would you like today? Would you like an appetizer? Oh, you need more time. It's okay, I'll come back. They don't get upset. They don't get angry. They don't, why? Because they know at the end of the night, they're gonna get a reward. So they're happy as, let me help you. You want me to take your jacket off? Oh, let me hang your jacket up over here so it doesn't get wrinkled. So you go to a nice restaurant. They take the crumbs off the table in between, in between your appetizer and your main course. When you go, go, go to Ruth Chris. You can borrow some money from Renee and go to Ruth Chris. All right? Chavez, he's got like nine kids. He has to have money. Okay? First time I ever went, someone took me for my 30th birthday. We're from Minnesota. We're from the country. Like, we killed our own cows and ate them, okay? They take me down to San Diego on the water. This is when I lived in Orange County. It was like a day trip. We went down there. And they, I sat down in the white linen. And it was like spotless white linen. Like, no wrinkles or nothing. This ain't Denny's, folks. They, they came between. I, got, I, ordered, I eat bread. I'm, I, you know, I'm like my daughter. You just eat and it's everywhere. And they came, they had this cool little thing, and they just go, whoa. <laughs> then they brought out this, and they brought out that. I was like, I'd never seen anything like that. They don't do that at McDonald's. <laughs> they waited on us. They didn't complain one time. And they had more than one waiter there. At, when you go to nice places, they got like more than, I mean, there's people coming and going and, and bumping me and helping me. And my, my drink never got like under that. I was like, where are, is this heaven? <laughs> but they got the reward at the end of the night. I don't even know. Two people, what did it cost? Two people, appetizers, uh, iced tea, sides, desserts. It was my birthday. I ordered good. And I wasn't paying. He said, you want dessert? I said, yes, sir. <laughs> they waited on us. Here, let me help you. The Bible says there are promises to those that wait. Here it is. If you wait, you'll have renewable strength. Your strength will be renewed. I'm speaking to every tired person in the room here. A tired person under the sound of my voice. You're exhausted by life, by the actions of others, or the actions of yourself. Whatever it may be, God, release some renewable strength on the waiters here. Release some renewable strength on the waiters here. If the strength of God, let it be renewed in the house because the gift is worth the wait. You will mount up with wings as eagles. Let me help you here. Eagles do not flap their wings. Eagles do not flap their wings. Hummingbirds flap their wings 40 to 80 beats a second. And they don't go very fast and they're not very strong. We were driving home from Vegas from a Thanksgiving trip. And we were up in the mountains and I saw these birds. We stopped at a rest area. And these birds were trying to take off. And they were trying to fly this way and the wind was... God specifically did not say you were a hummingbird or a bird. He said you will mount up with wings like an eagle. Why? Listen, eagle's wings are strong, are pound, are, are stronger than any airplane wing pound per pound. Eagle's wings are stronger than any airplane wing pound per pound. What does that tell me? Anything that man can create, God can create it stronger. Any storm you're going through, Quit flapping your wings and start soaring. Quit flapping, doing everything you can. Quit fighting the battle like this and start. Quit flapping and crying and complaining and moaning and start. God didn't call you to be a hummingbird. He called you to be an eagle. Come on, lift your hands and begin to soar in the house. Come on, lift your hands. I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. I'm ready, I'm ready. The Spirit of God is here empowering you right now. Lift your hands. He's mounting you up with wings as eagles to fly over your problems, to soar over your troubles, to get over your drama. You will walk. What does that mean? You will be mobile. 
which is the opposite of stagnation. It's the opposite of complacency. You will be mobile. You will move. You will go forward. You will not faint. What does that mean? You won't fail. You won't fail. You won't fail. The enemy's told you you're a loser. The enemy's told you you're going to fail. The enemy's told you you're never going to make it. But I'm here with the word of the Lord for you. You will not fail. Here's the last promise. If you wait, he will lift you up. Psalms 37, 34. He will exalt you to inherit the land. You will look on the wicked as they are cut off. You missed it. When you wait, God gives you an inheritance. You missed it. When you wait, God gives you a piece of land. When you wait, God gives you an inheritance. When you wait, you will get something other people won't get. When you wait, you inherit the promise. My inheritance is not for my sake. The psalmist says, the inheritance is for the sake of my children and my children's children and my children's children. You missed it. If God tarries 30, 40, 50, 70 years, there's going to be some young people that are going to be grandmas and grandpas by then that are going to say, because of you, because of my mama praying in the middle of the night, because my daddy got up early before work and prayed, I'm here. Let me... Your children will not inherit your curses because they've already been broken. Your children will not inherit your weaknesses. They're already covered by the blood. Your children will only inherit the promises and the blessing and the overflow. They're not going to inherit anything else. Lift your hands if you believe this. Receive it right now. John 10 and 10. It's the abundant life. The abundant life. Your children won't inherit your failures. Your children don't inherit your curses. Your children don't inherit your sins. I'm helping somebody here this morning. Your children will not inherit the demons that held you down. Your children. Your children will inherit the overflow. Last thing as I'm closing here. 500 started. Five hundred started the wait, but how many made it? Three hundred and eighty people. Three hundred and eighty missed the gift. God help me to be in the 120. Because when the storms come, I'm not gonna fly, I'm gonna soar. Because if you wait on the gift, you will receive power. Because Corinthians says, for where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, freedom. I love all the high tech stuff. I love everything we got here. I want more of it, ask pastor. But some of you don't need more sound and more lights and more flash. You need to wait on every millennial in here. You need to wait on the Lord. You don't need to go talk to your friend. You need to get in this altar and you need to wait on the Lord until he gives you the gift. In the name of Jesus. God, we care more about what you think today than what the world thinks. I want to be in the 120 so bad. I don't care about the 380 right now. I just, I want to wait on the gift. God, I want to align myself with the gift. If that's you, as they sing, would you make your way up here? Throw your hands in the air and say, I'm going to wait on you, Jesus. I'm going to wait on you, Jesus. I'm gonna wait on you, Jesus. I'm gonna wait on you. Say, I'm gonna wait on you, Jesus. 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 I'm gonna wait.
That's it right now. Here comes the gift. I'm gonna wait on here you, comes Jesus. the gift. Here comes the gift. I'm gonna wait on you, Jesus. Here it comes. Here it comes. I'm gonna wait on you, Jesus. Yes. I'm gonna wait on yes. you, Jesus. I'm gonna wait on yes. you, Jesus. I'm gonna wait on you, Jesus. Here it comes. Here it comes. Here it comes. I'm gonna wait on you, Jesus. I'm gonna wait on you, Jesus. Turn